Okay, so we're going to be starting section four now. Section four is called uh, separating, um, and we start with chapter 15. And in chapter 15, uh, we're going to be looking at the three types of separating or material removal operations. Okay, um, so separating uh, as a production process can be divided into three broad categories. We have machining, shearing, and flame cutting. Okay, um, in all of these separating processes, the basic elements are that we will need a tool or cutting device. We will need some type of movement between the workpiece and the cutting device. And the workpiece is the is the part, the object, the thing that we are going to be cutting or that we're going to be separating uh, parts from, removing material from, okay? So that's the workpiece. And there has to be movement between the cutting device and the workpiece, okay? And the third basic element of separating production processes um, is uh, the workpiece, the cutting device, or both are going to be clamped or supported in some type of desired position, okay? So uh, the three elements that we need are a tool or cutting device, movement between the workpiece and the cutting device, and then a way to hold the workpiece or to hold the cutting device. So we have to hold one or the other. Obviously, if we have movement between those two, one is going to be moving and the other is going to be held stationary, okay? Um, and the definition of separating is uh, all the operations that, in which excess material is removed to create the desired part size, shape, or surface finish, okay? Um, separating is also commonly referred to as the material removal process, okay? So looking at each one of these basic elements, um, cutting devices can be divided up into four different categories. We have chip removing devices. That is to say, the cutting device is gonna remove a chip from the material. A series of chips is gonna re be removed um, to, to make the finished part. Uh, a shearing device, shearing, think of uh, like scissors, Okay, so that's a shearing device where we're basically making a slice through the object and and cutting it into two or more pieces. Non-traditional cutting devices, these include uh, using laser light, uh, electrical uh, discharge, chemical, and plasma. And then flame. And usually flame is uh, going to fall into the category of uh, welding type operations, right? They're actually the opposite of welding. Welding is when you're gluing two things together, but we we recognize it as part of the world of welding, that is flame cutting. So we have oxyacetylene, oxygasoline, oxyhydrogen, NPS, and MAP gas, propylene, and fuel gas, and butane and propane, okay? Um, looking at the chip removing uh, cutting devices, we can have a single point cutting device, that is there's one point of contact between the cutting device and the workpiece, removing a chip, one chip at a time. Multi-points, so think of multi-points as like um, maybe a drill bit, right, where we have four, five, or six different flutes around the uh, perimeter of the of the drill bit, um, and each one of those is sharpened, and each one, is, one of those is gonna be cutting uh, as the as the um, drill bit rotates. And then we also have random point. Now, if you're wondering what a random point um, chip removal or cutting device is, think of a abrasive cutter, okay? So think of a, a grinding operation, right? That's actually removing material. So it's it's um, it falls under the separating or material removal process. So um, a, a grinding process where we have random um, like particles uh, in the in the grinding wheel, or in it, you know, you might think of it also as uh, sandpaper is also a random point uh, chip removing cutting device. I know you you don't often think of sandpaper as a cutting device, but technically speaking, um, when we're sanding wood, we're going to re be removing small particles of that wood. Okay, and th that would be a random point uh, cutting device. All right. 
So let's focus in now on the machining process. Okay, machining is probably the most uh, prevalent uh, manufacturing process, um, if if not, uh, you know, uh, more prevalent than a uh, plastic injection molding uh, process or an extrusion process, which is also very, very popular. Um, it's definitely going to be in the top three, okay? Um, and in terms of separating, uh, those production processes of machining is going to be the most popular, the most prevalent uh, type of operation. Machining is what we call a subtractive process. That is to say, we're going to be taking our, our we're, we're, we have our workpiece, and we're going to be using some kind of a tool, and this is typically a single point or a multi-point cutting device, and we're going to be removing parts of the material. We're going to be removing material until we reach the final shape, okay? Um, ma the machining process can create finished parts, all right? So we can start with a blank of metal, a billet of aluminum or steel or whatever, and we can cut it all down until we get to the desired shape. Um, we call that a primary process. When we when we start with the the raw material, the billet of material, and when we finish, we have the the finished product. Okay, um, not including assembly, but the finished product. We call that a primary process. It can also be used to finalize the shape after a preliminary operation. So you think in terms of a casting operation or a forging operation. Um, you remember from the last uh, sections that casting and forging generally do not create surfaces that are very fine. They're not, you know, high quality surfaces. They're not smooth. Um, and, and sometimes we want or need a smooth, uh, true, accurate surface. And so after a casting or forging operation, we may then take that part that's, that's out of the casting and forging process and we may take it to a CNC machine tool and we may drill some holes in it or we may clean off a surface, make it nice and smooth, okay? In that case, machining would be called the secondary process. That is to say it comes, we it's the process after the primary process, which would be casting or forging in that example. Um, it can be used to create a desired surface finish, right? So it can be a finishing process. Um, and then it can be used to create molds or dyes, which means that it's a t it can create tools, which then go on to create other uh, finished parts. Okay, so there's a lot of applications for machining, and this is part of the reason why machining is so popular. Machining is so prevalent. Um, it's also a, a highly accurate, highly customizable, you know, uh, uh, process. Um, there's a lot of people who know how to machine. There's a lot of machine tools out there that can do this, different shapes, sizes, configurations, all, all that good stuff. Um, so machining is a very adaptable uh, production process that can be used at a lot of different points in the manufacturing process. Uh, as I said, machining is extremely flexible. We have nearly unlimited form freedom, okay? Not, not unlimited, right? We still can't drill uh, holes that, that follow some kind of shape. Uh, we basically have to drill, uh, you know, straight through. We still can't, um, you know, make uh, detailed interior surfaces, okay? But for all intents and purposes, it's a nearly unlimited form freedom. Nearly all materials can be machined. These, this includes plastics, wood, and ceramics. All right, so it's very adaptable to different materials. Um, it can be used to produce single prototypes, so onesies and twosies, uh, small series production, or very large-scale production runs, okay? Uh, and we have a, a wide range of material removal methods. We have the mechanical, that is drilling, milling, uh, face, um, uh, excuse me, face milling, turning operations, boring, reaming, all that stuff, which we'll talk about. Uh, we can also um, use uh, heat, we can use lasers, and we can use high pressure water, okay? <clears throat> so um, when we look at the, the machining process, uh, we need to keep in mind what's called the manufacturing triangle because it's 
what you know what we get into now is the economics of of the production process which process and and to this date we we know about casting and forging we know about machining okay and all the various flavors of those three types of of production processes but now we have to decide we have to look at which type of process we're going to be going with and when we do that it it helps to keep in mind the what's called the manufacturing triangle and that's basically um, a look at the different aspects of cost part cost part quality and part function okay so part cost Basically, what that means is, can it be made inexpensively, right? We want the part to be made, but we want it to be made as, as inexpensively as possible. I'm not going to say cheaply because we want the part to function, right? We're not talking about a part that's going to fall apart, um, but we're talking about a part that uh, meets the uh, requirements of its function, but it can be made, it can be produced for as little as possible. So when we when we look at the cost that aspect of it, we have to address materials. How expensive are the materials? Uh, how expensive is the tooling? Right? How expensive is the machine operator? Is this a highly skilled uh, person, or is this you know someone that is lightly skilled or even unskilled? Um, how much machining time is required, and what is the volume of production? As we move on to quality, part quality, we want to address can it be made well, right? Um, and that comes down to uh, can it meet the tolerancing requirements that we have of it? And again, think of casting versus forging versus machining. Those are three different levels of tolerance capabilities. Casting is probably the least precise operation. Machining is probably of those three the most precise. In fact, machining of all the production processes is probably the single most precise process that we could use, right? Um, so uh, can, can we meet the tolerancing requirements and can we produce the surface that we want? And then finally, part function. Can it be made, okay? Um, and, and bear in mind that this has to, a lot to do with the, the specific manufacturing process. We can't make everything through a forging process or a machining process, okay? Uh, there may be geometry that we can't cut or that we can't forge, all right? It may be too small or the part may be too large for us to easily machine or cast or forge it. Or the materials may not lend itself well or even at all to the production process that, that we are kind of steering towards, right? It may be of a metal or a plastic that just isn't suited to what we have in mind. So, uh, so when we start now to address um, how are we gonna make the part, keep in mind that we have these three questions to ask. Can it be made inexpensively? Can it be made well? And can it be made at all given its geometry and material uh, constraints? All right, so looking more uh, in depth at the machining process and the chip removal process, this figure um, is, is definitely going more in depth than um, we really need to go into, but um, it's a good figure to really show you at the microscopic scale what's happening, okay? So I don't want you to get bogged down with rake angle and contour angle and cutting speed and relief angle. That's for a different class. That's for a more detailed discussion of the machining process. But what we can see here is that we have the cutting tool. And in this case, we have a single point cutter, right? There's the cutting tool. Um, and it's shaving off a, um, a chip right here, right? And you can see the chip is kind of being bent away. This is, this is typically what happens. And you'll see this in the videos that I've um, included in the Canvas uh, module for this, for this section. Um, and then we have in the middle here, this red zone, what they call the shear zone. This is the area where the chip is going to basically break away. All right, so there's a continuous, 
as the cutting speed is going to drive the cutter across the surface of the material, it's going to be continuously curling these chips away and breaking them off, right? So we get a continuous curl and break, curl and break, curl and break, okay? Um, so in, in effect, the machining process, when we're talking about chip removal process, the material removal process, it is one of shearing material away, okay? She because we're shearing the material right there. That's, that's a shear zone. So uh, because we're going to be shearing, um, in order to cut the metal, the tool most, must overcome the shear strength of the metal. Remember, the shear strength is shown in the stress-strain stress curve, right? And the shear strength is basically the top of that curve, right? The shear strength, right? Um, because we're trying to break, we're trying to separate the material. We're not just trying to bend it. We're trying to separate it, break it, break it off. So that's the shear strength. Um, so the shear strength increases with the yield stress, right? An indicator of the machining ease, that is how easy a material is to machine or its difficulty, is the material's yield stress. So if we look at this table, just shows some yield stresses right here. This is in units of megapascals. Think of, think that. Think about that in terms of, um, you know, the, the equivalent English units would be PSI, pounds per square inch, okay? Um, so low carbon steels have a yield stress of between 250 to 395 megapascals. So a relatively high yield stress. Magnesium has a uh, middle yield stress, 125 to 165, and polycarbonate plastic has a lower yield strength, okay? so um, the low carbon steel is going to be the more difficult to machine because there's going to be more um, strength that's required in the tool to overcome the shear stress. The higher shield stress, higher yield stress, um, which means harder to machine. Versus the plastic, which of course you can imagine uh, is going to be relatively easy, certainly relative to low carbon steels, much easier to, uh, to cut and machine. Okay. Now, um, I included in here the approximate cost. I I'm sorry about the table. The table is in uh, um, euros per kilogram. This was <laughs> obviously a table from a European um, paper. But um, it, it kind of gives you an indication, you know, this may be kind of contrary to what you would think. You know, low carbon steels, wow, they're, they're really hard to machine, right? Certainly harder than magnesium, which is a relatively soft uh, metal and certainly polycarbonate, which is a plastic, right? But look at the, the cost difference here. Um, and it might have to do not just, well, not might, it does have to do with more than just the straight on machining, uh, cost. There's a lot of low carbon steels. Um, it's very common. So this, the economics of it is driving this cost down. Polycarbonate is difficult to machine, not because it's difficult to shear the chip off, so to speak, but because um, the the plastic tends to gum up the uh, the tool. So we get the plastic that melts to the tool, and and this makes it very difficult to machine. And so that's why the cost is, relatively speaking, so high. Okay, so. Um, so that's just a couple things to take into account. Now, if uh, again, this is just another view of that cutting process, and we can see the tool here. Here's the tool, and the V is the velocity. So the tool is moving across here. The workpiece is being held. And microscopically, what's happening is this shear zone. This is the shear zone where the material is being cut. This is the chip being formed. And you can see these are these are called shear zones, right? And so this is how the chip is formed and the material is actually cut. All right. Um, so the machining generates heat. This is our shear zone and we have tool material friction. So there's friction in here. And that's kind of why polycarbonate, because it generates heat and the polycarbonate melts and it gums up the tool. This is why this cost, one factor why this cost is so high. Um, but Oftentimes in, in metal removal, metal cutting, we, we see the application of coolants or lubricants, right? A coolant or lubricant is going to do two things. 
all right? We flood the zone, so we put the coolant in here, and that's going to A, keep down the, uh, the temperature uh, generated from the tool material friction, right? So it's gonna keep that temperature down. It's also going to help to lubricate the process. So it's a cooling and a lubricating process, all right? Um, third, thirdly, it also um, helps to wash away chips from the cutting zone. When we're cutting something, we don't want the chips to stay in this area because that also is going to gum up the, the tool and can erode or limit tool life, okay? <clears throat> so looking at the different types of cutting devices that we have for a uh, metal cutting process, all right, um, we have these tools where we have a single uh, bit on the end of it. This is the cutting tip right there. You can see it's a triangle. Here we have a quadrilateral and here's another quadrilateral. These are made from extremely hard materials, ceramics typically, all right? And they're held in place. And then when they wear out, we just index it, right? You can see that we can rotate this 180 degrees. We can rotate the triangular 160 degrees. We can rotate this one 180 degrees to give us another surface that we can machine on. In fact, we could also flip this um, on the back side if we needed to, to get. So in total, there's one, two, three, four possible uh, surfaces that we can cut. Um, then we have this uh, uh, cutting device, which has four cutting surfaces on it. Um, this is called a face mill, and this has a multi-point cutting device or cutting uh, devices on it, right? And you can see all of these are indexable. That means we can rotate them to get a better surface. And then here we have an array of what are called end mills, all right? So end mills are a very common um, cutting device for uh, metal machining, all right? Um, and an end mill looks like a drill bit, except the intention of the end mill is to cut along its periphery. So the cutting is done on the shank side of the of the end mill, right? Rather than the drill bit where the cutting is all gonna be on the tip, right? Um, so we have different types. These are uh, flat end mills. This is a bull nose or radius rounded nose end mill, right? And you can also see the number of flutes. Here we have, you know, it's tough to count. It looks like four. This has four flutes, one, two, three, and then four. This one looks like it has uh, many more, maybe, uh, it's kind of hard to see, maybe six or eight. Again, this is a two point, right? So we have one, two right there. Again, another two point, okay? So um, the industry, the machining industry always wants to, pro to maximize processing speed, right? That means we want to maximize our cutting depth, how deep we're cutting. We want to maximize the width of the chip. We want to take off as much material as we can, and we want to move the tool as fast as we can. Speed, depth of cut, and uh, and cut chip width is is all all that we're looking at here. Okay, but all of those things, if we maximize all those things, we're going to break a lot of tool bits, and we're going to make a lot of nasty cuts. All right, and so that's going to negatively affect part quality. So all of those factors, cutting depth, chip width, and tool speed are going to be um, compromised by our desire or need for a highly accurate, good surface finish, okay? So um, one other thing is tool strength and stiffness is vital, right? So you can imagine with a cutting tool like this, right? We're cutting along the perimeter here, which means there's going to be forces when, when we cut something, when this rotates around and the flute impacts the the surface of the workpiece it's going to there's going to be a force generated and that force is if it's if it's high enough it's going to shear off a chip so um, it, you you can think of that as a series of very quick hammer blows right boom 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 we're, we're hitting it with a hammer right um, and uh, that's going to tend to cause this tool to vibrate and that vibration is going to be very bad for the surface finish and very bad for the tool. 
So we want these tools to be as stiff as possible so they don't vibrate. Okay. Um, so looking more in depth at the machining process, we can break it down into two categories. We have traditional machining and non-traditional machining. Traditional machining, again, can be further broken down into uh, chip removal processes, which include turning, milling, drilling, planing, broaching, and boring, and abrasion processes, which includes polishing, buffing, lapping, grinding, honing, and then super finishing. In the non-traditional category, we have abrasion again, but this is a different type of abrasion, right? Uh, and erosion. Now, with this type of abrasion, notice that we we actually don't have uh, kind of the material interface that we would have from a from a buffing or grinding operation, right? So we have a water hydro hydrophonic. So we have a water jet ultrasonic machining, water jet mag magnetic abrasive finishing. So these are the non-traditional methods. All right, looking at the machine tools. Okay, the machine tools here. We have uh, four basic types of machine tools. All right, we have a horizontal end mill, and it's horizontal. It's named horizontal because the orientation of the spindle, which is right here, is horizontal. The spindle is where the tool is attached, which is going to be doing the cutting on the workpiece. Okay, so this has a, the horizontal milling machine has a horizontal spindle. This is a vertical milling machine, right? And in the vertical milling machine, the spindle is mounted in a vertical orientation. You can see it right here, okay? So the tool is on the end of this and the spindle is mounted uh, vertically. Uh, and then we have a turning center or a lathe, right? And in this case, the workpiece is going to be rotating, right? And the tool is gonna to be held stationary. All right, um, and the turning center or lathes are used to create cylindrical objects, objects with a axis of revolution, okay? And then finally, the fourth type is kind of a combination of all of these, and this would be a multi-axis. Think of a five-axis as an example, a five-axis CNC machining center. And a five-axis machining center is, an, is a machining center that can translate in the three translational directions, that is X, Y, and Z, and it can rotate in two directions. So it can rotate around the table, right? This is the table, and it can rotate the spindle, okay? Rotate around the spindle. So it's helpful to think of these machine tools in terms of their axes of operation, right? Um, so the, the horizontal end mill, can be a four axis or a three axis end mill. So we always have three translational axes, X, Y, and Z, right? But we may have, we may be able to rotate the table here. The table is where the workpiece sits. That would give us a fourth uh, degree of freedom, a rotational degree of freedom. So this would be called a four, uh, a four axis machine tool. In this configuration here, this vertical end mill is a three axis end mill. There is no uh, rotation of the table or rotation of the spindle other than rotating around the tool, right? Um, no rotation of the spindle. And so it's only limited to its three translational degrees of freedom, X, Y, and Z. Um, with the, with the lathe, we, lathe, we get, um, uh, three translational and one rotational degree of freedom. And then with the five axis, we get five, you know, uh, or four axis end mills. Um, you'll hear the term CNC a lot, and you'll watch videos of CNC machining. CNC machining is computer controlled machining, okay? As opposed to the old way, which was manual machining. Now there still is manual machining done. Oftentimes that's done in a prototyping environment. Um, it does take a little bit of effort and work to set up a CNC machine tool and to get it to start uh, machining on a part, especially if that part is complicated. Um, manual machine tools uh, are a little bit easier to do one piece or two piece, right? Certainly when you get into production volume, uh, CNC is going to be everything. 
All right, so now let's focus in on the turning process, all right? Um, so we're not gonna go into much depth here, all right? So let me just say a little bit about this. Um, first of all, I've included a lot of different videos of each one of these processes because as I've said before, I don't believe you can look at pictures and I don't believe you can hear me talk and you're going to understand the process like watching a video is going to do. So I've put in some nice short videos where you can get a really good feel of the turning process, machining process, five axis, all that good stuff, CNC, all that good stuff, okay? So please, please, please make sure you watch the videos. It's, it's really imperative, especially for this chapter, for this section. So there's different types of turning operations, different things that we can do on a turning center or a lathe, okay? And those include facing, tapering, contouring, uh, chamfering, drilling, boring, we can make threads, we can do knurling, okay? So these are all, these are examples of parts that were made on a, uh, on a lathe or a turning center, okay? Notice that they all are cylindrical, okay? That's one of the, you're, you're going to make cylindrical parts on a, on a turning center or a lathe, all right? So here is a CNC turning center, all right? So let's just real quickly look at the different, um, parts of it here. Uh, the turret, the tool turret here is where different tools are, are, uh, held or, or located for use during the operation. Okay. So the, many of the CNC tooling, um, uh, machine tools, they'll have multiple tools that they can hold, right? So in our CNC program, we can call different tools and the machine can switch out tools in the middle of a cutting operation. So it can use an end mill to do, to do one thing and then it can switch tools and go get a drill bit and, and drill some holes and then switch tools again. So the tool turret is just where it keeps all the tools while it's waiting, to, while they're waiting to be used. Okay. The three jaw chuck, right, is where the workpiece is held. Right. So this right here, and this is not a good view of the, of the, of the chuck. You'll see it in the videos much better, but this is where, uh, it's basically like the rotating vice that the workpiece is going to be held and uh, rotated around while it's being cut, okay? Uh, the spindle is where the tool is held, right? Um, and then the control panel is where the machine operator, the CNC machine tool operator, is going to uh, input the program and monitor it and do anything else that's required, okay? Um, oh, and by the way, this door slides shut. Right. So it opens up so that you can get in here, replace the workpiece, do whatever you need, change the tool, whatever. Um, but it's shut during the machining operation. All right. So that's a turning center. This is a manual uh, lathe. I'm not going to use turning center because turning centers are usually limited to CNC machines. All right. So this is a manual lathe. Now in this, um, notice that you got a lot of dials here. So these dials are used by the machine operator to advance the tool or to retract a tool. Okay. So these are used to control the location of the tool. The chuck is right here. This is again, you can kind of see that this is a three jaw chuck and it looks like there's a workpiece right there. There's a short little stub of a, um, of, of some type of cylindrical workpiece right there. Um, this shield is where the cutting is going to be, uh, is going to happen. So this shield protects the, um, the operator. This is the spindle. So this would be brought down. So this whole area down here, this whole thing is going to be moved to the left, um, uh, for, to, to clamp on the smaller, uh, larger work pieces. Now, in this case, this is a very small work piece. So you probably don't need the spindle to be brought over. Uh, to hold the end of the workpiece here. You you know, it's small enough so that you can just operate it like that. All right, moving on to milling. All right, so um, a milling operation can include drilling, face milling, end milling, and boring, right? So notice end milling, again, we're cutting along the perimeter, perimeter, for, <laughs> sorry, perimeter or periphery, right? Drilling, we're really cutting, even though we are, Nah, we're not really cutting along the periphery, right? Um, you know, the tool is designed to just go in and cut on the end, right? 
Um, so in the milling operation, we have the workpiece, right? This is the material. Uh, it sits on a work table and the work table can move in the X and Y direction. So that's two degrees of freedom. Um, we can move the tool. This is the cutter, the tool. It can move in the Z direction. So that's a third degree of freedom. And then in some cases we can rotate it along what's called the B axis or the A axis, right? The axes perpendicular to the X and Y directions. Examples of some milling tools. We've seen these before, but um, it bears repeating again. We have an end mill and this one you can really nicely see the four flutes. There's one cutting edge, two, three, and four cutting edges um, and the cutting edges along the shank. We have a ball nose end mill, right? And you guess why it's called a ball nose end mill. Um, we have what's called a slab mill and a slab mill is a cutting device that's used in um, a, let's say a horizontal end mill, right? Um, and it's just gonna be cutting along a large surface, okay? Um, and this is how, it, this is a slab mill in operation, right? See how it's just cutting that surface. And then we have a face mill. And this is nice because you can see, uh, look how much material we're cutting away. I mean, we're cutting on, by the way, we're cutting this surface right here. We're not really cutting on this surface at all, okay? Um, but we are cutting this material. And what you can't see in front is we're, we're obviously cutting in front, right? So I think we can, we can ascertain from this picture that the face mill is moving from the front of the picture to the back of the picture, right? Um, and so what it's going to be doing is it's cutting along this edge all in the front. And look at these massive chips that are created. Now, you, you, the reason why they're that bluish color is from the, from the heat of the, of the cutting process, all right? We're, we're heating this up so much, we're actually heat treating the metal, all right? Um, again, please watch the videos. There's some really awesome, cool videos. Um, I have some slow-mo videos of the cutting process that are like mesmerizing. They're really, really cool to watch. Um, all right, so looking at some different um, milling machines, this is a CNC vertical milling machine. Looks so very similar to a CNC turning center, right? We have the control panel, we have the tool turret, we have the sliding door, we have the table for work holding, and then we have the spindle. All right, so it's just the orientation of the spindle that matters. And in the case of the turning center, what rotates and what doesn't. Here, the table is not really going to rotate. Here is a vertical milling machine, a manual vertical milling machine. Looks a lot like a drill press. And of course, it can be used as a drill press. All right, but notice the table here can uh, traverse in the X direction laterally. Um, and we can also move it in and out in the Y direction. And of course the Z direction, the direction of the spindle can be moved up and down. Here is a horizontal milling machine and here's the spindle. And so you can see that it has a horizontal configuration. This is much more open. So obviously this type of milling machine is used in this case for larger parts. Okay, so there's no, um, you know, uh, protective walls around it. Uh, and the, the piece is gonna be put on this table right here, clamped down. These grooves in the table are used for uh, clamping or work holding. Um, this is the spindle where the tool is gonna to be uh, attached. And here's the CNC operators uh, panel. And here is a manual uh, horizontal milling machine. Looks very similar to the vertical milling machine, except of course the turret or spindle, or excuse me, not turret, the spindle is horizontal, okay? Um, and this is an example of a five-axis CNC machining center, all right? And um, I like this one. I picked this one out because it has a really good um, uh, diagram of the different degrees of freedom, okay? So remember that a five-axis means we have five degrees of freedom. We we always have the three translational degrees of freedom, right? These are the X, Y, and Z directions, right? We can translate or move in those directions. Then we can rotate 
in two more axes, right? We can rotate, um, and, and notice that this axis is, this axis of rotation is parallel to the x axis. So the a axis is a rotation of the, of the pallet, right? Or the, or, or the table rotation, uh, along an axis or around an axis parallel to the x axis. And the b axis rotation is a rotation of the table around an axis parallel to the y axis. Okay. So that generates our one, two, three, four, five, five axis CNC machining centers. Okay. Um, now again, this is my last, uh, uh, statement about this. Go watch these videos. There's awesome videos, short videos. You know, um, I think the longest one I got in there is maybe, maybe 10, 12 minutes, something like that. But generally they're like two, three, some of them are even, uh, less than a minute. Go watch those. Okay. Um, because they're really going to paint a really clear picture for you about the whole machining process. All right. So that's it. I will see you in the next video.